Awesome. Well, this is a fantastic group. I'm super excited to be here. Um, just very briefly, this is my contact information. So if you want to hit me on Twitter, I'm Kay Weens. Uh, and then also, and I'll show you later, but uh, all of you should have a profile page on iFixit. It's a good way to uh, drive awareness. And from a selfish perspective, uh, iFixit has really good search engine placement. So if you, uh, if you create a profile page, it's a good way to have a document that, to promote yourself that shows up uh, very high on Google. OK. So bit of an introduction to iFixit for those of you that are, are new to us. We've got a, uh, we actually just celebrated our 10th year anniversary, and our focus has always been about how do we get repair out there in the hands of, of as many people as possible? How can we lower the barriers to entry to people to do repairs themselves or to start repair businesses? Uh, we have about three and a half million uh, unique visitors on the website a month, um, and we've you know we supply parts and tools to a broad swath of repair shops all around the world. As a matter of fact, and I'm realizing I don't need this, uh, we provide uh, all of the repair parts and tools to the only uh, Apple repair shop in Nepal. <laughs> and we've, we've sort of been surprised over time. We put repair manuals out there. We don't always know what's going to happen with it. We had somebody approach us the other day and say, hey, you know, we just wanted to thank you because uh, you, you allowed us to do a repair we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. And I was like, oh, okay, well, tell me, you know, where were you fixing this computer? And they said, oh, well, we were about 300 miles from the nearest village in the jungle of Malawi. And uh, we just happened to actually know it was Cameroon. They were in the jungles in Cameroon. And they had, uh, they had a Wi-Fi connection and a generator and two laptops. And they broke one of the laptops. And so they were able to uh, pull it apart using instructions off the internet from the one computer and use it to repair the other one. And that idea that, that information is an empowering technology has been fundamental to iFixit. We want to train people. Uh, give the, give the, get the knowledge out there in the hands of as many people as possible and then see what kind of opportunities spring from that. And I think we've seen a real trend in the last several years. There's mobile and cell phone and tablet repair shops springing up all over the place. And part of that is because the internet has been such a phenomenal tool for getting information on all of these disparate devices in the hands of the technicians when they need it. We've identified over 5,000 different cell phones on the market. Not, not presently on the market, but they've been sold over the last few years. There are hundreds of different Android devices out there. And uh, you're not going to have a technician that is trained and can operate on every single phone or every single tablet on site. You need additional information on how to get in. It's not like the, the good old days of the PC, where once you learn how to work on a few PC boxes, you're going to be able to have anybody without any, any additional experience take apart and dismantle or repair any PC. This is on a device by device basis. And that's part of why everybody has gravitated more toward Apple devices is that they're, they're, they're more consistent. I mean, you know, so this is an iPad 2, and Apple probably sold 20 million of these, of this specific model, where it's a little bit harder in the Android market. Uh, there are, there's only a few really blockbuster Android phones, and then the rest of it is kind of a long tail effect. Um, we, we, do, we sell parts and tools ourselves. That's kind of how we fund our operation. And uh, we brought some tools for you guys today, so I'll share some tools with you later. We thought about handing the tools out at the beginning, and then we realized that you just turn to your neighbor and start taking their computers apart. <laughs> I know we're all gear, you know, we're all gearheads. We're all we're all li liking the wrench on things, so we decided to hold off uh, later. We sell tools to every intelligence agency in the world that I know of. Uh, Probably a lot more than I don't know about. So anybody who's doing forensic analysis on hardware and needs to get into these devices is buying our tools. Uh, we, we sell tools to most repair shops around the world. Um, and then uh, you know, clearly our, our repair manuals are kind of what we're known for. And the reason is that uh, you know, back in the dark ages of, say, something like if you wanted to be a mechanic or a computer repair uh, guy back in like 1990, there were sort of these. This was how you, you did it. You learn how to figure it out yourself. Uh, you go and buy a printed repair manual, and you still you go down to AutoZone and you buy the Haynes manual for twenty bucks. Or uh, if you're really feeling ambitious, you go to a trade school. Uh, that's sort of your options. Or you're in one of these programs here where you're you're mentoring under somebody who's going to teach you. That's not how we do it anymore. Instead, people just go and they Google it, 
And this is, this is how repair has been for the last 10 or 15 years. And the reason that I started iFixit was because I was trying to fix my iBook. It was a clamshell iBook, the one with the handle. And I dropped it on the power plug, dropped it off the bed in my dorm room. And I, the power plug was loose. It was the sort of thing where if I, if I held the power plug just right and kind of you know, did the dance, it would sort of work. <laughs> I'm like, OK, it's just a, a loose drop of solder. Like, I ought to be able to take this apart. I've, I've built my own computer. Like, this should not be a problem for me to take this apart and put a couple drops of solder on these pens. And so I start taking the computer apart, and I ran into plastic tabs. And I, eventually, I sort of got the thing apart. And I used my soldering iron that my grandpa gave me before I went to school. There's, there's a space up here. Do you want to join us up here? And there's also a space over here. Sorry, no, you're totally fine. So. I, I resolder it, and then I go and I'm starting to put the computer back together, and I cannot, for the life of me, I can't, for the life of me, figure out how to put the computer back together. So I do what anybody would do. I went online and I googled, you know, iBook service manual, and I couldn't find anything. And I'm sitting there, like, why in the world is the service manual for this computer not on the internet? And I did a little bit more research, and I learned that there were a number of websites that used to have the service manual, and got a mean takedown letter from Apple's lawyers saying, "Knock it off, or we'll sue you." And so they took the service manual offline. And it turns out that this is the way that the world works with all of these, these uh, tablets and small devices these days, is the manufacturers don't really want any of us repairing them. And they're not out there sharing the service information on them. So it's kind of up to all of us to fend for ourselves and figure it out. And so what I did, I was, I was so frustrated with Apple that I said, OK, well, fooey on you. Uh, and the nice thing about being young and maybe a little bit stupid <laughs> is that you don't really know what's not possible. And so I went ahead and uh, took my computer apart again, took pictures, and then I posted the repair manual online, mostly out of spite. And uh, the first weekend I posted online, we had 10,000 hits. We had tons of people. And I'm like, who in the world is looking at this boring service manual? How in the world are 10,000 people interested? Turns out a lot of people are interested. And uh, so that was, that was sort of the beginning. And you've got a question here. Well, no, I just want to know what made you not get sued by Apple? Sure. Why weren't we sued by Apple? We, it, it's because we took the computer that I owned, I took pictures of it, I created content myself, and I, I published it online. So copyright infringement is taking someone else's work and republishing it. So if you go to the bookstore and you buy a book and you photocopy it and you sell that book, that's copyright infringement. If you give the book away, that's still copyright infringement. Uh, but if you write your own book, then it's fine. So we wrote our own service manuals. I own the copyright to the service manuals. And so we post them online, and they're good to go. And then, because I didn't want anybody else to suffer from iFixit going after them for copying our manuals, we released all of our manuals under an open source Creative Commons license. So you ha explicitly have our permission to take all of our manuals and copy them and cut and paste and give them to your technicians. And there's actually there's a website that just popped up that translated a whole bunch of our manuals into Turkish. And they're hosting them out of Turkey. And I think that's really cool. We're, we're hoping to build translation into iFixit so we can have like native Turkish uh, on, on the iFixit.com site. But our technology isn't quite there yet. And so the market said, well, we're going to take it and we're going to put up our own site with your manuals. So we're absolutely thrilled. We think that's really exciting. How many employees are at iFixit right now? Sure. Uh, so how many employees do we have? We have about 50 people. Um, we run a software company where we provide software services to manufacturers, so that's a big chunk of it. And then also p folks that are designing tools. I think we've got the best repair tools in the world, but all of you will be the judge <laughs> when you get them home and decide if you like them or not. Uh, and then uh, we, you know, we sell parts and iPhone parts and Xbox parts and hard drives and RAM and that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah, good question. So uh, we'll dive right into some of the technical details. There is a uh, proprietary screw on the bottom of the iPhone. Um, and there is a, the same screw on the bottom of a lot of, um, a lot of the laptops. And yeah, so it's a five-point screw. It's not the same geometry shape as a Torx. So if you had a five-pointed Torx, it wouldn't work. Uh, it's, it's a new shape, and from what we, we've done a, a, quite a bit of research, they haven't patented it. So they switched to a proprietary screw for whatever reason they didn't patent it, and we think it's because they stole it from someone else and couldn't patent it. <laughs> but that's our best guess. So it's a screwdriver that's new. Nobody has it, but it's not patented. So what we did was we reverse engineered the screw, we produced them. In the toolkits I'm giving all of you is the screws, uh, 
for the screwdriver for both this and for the iPhone. Okay. So you'll be able to get inside them. Oh, fantastic. Can you please follow up with me afterwards and share that information? Because, yeah, that was my impression was that it was a, it was a medical device screw that they took and resized. Because we saw it in some medical device catalogs. OK, fantastic. Let's follow up because that's, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, OK, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. So this is uh, just very brief. Uh, iFixit is an online community. It's not just us publishing manuals anymore. The whole set is a wiki, it's open source, and our mission is to make it easy for anyone to learn how to repair things and simple for people to share their repair knowledge. So the idea of being an open source repair wiki is that I know how to fix some things, I figured out how to fix the iBook, but I don't necessarily know how to repair guitars. And so it sure be nice if you share what you know, I share what I know, and if all of us give a little bit, uh, we're going to end up with far more value than any of us would, would be able to have if, if we just created internal instructions just for us to use. So as you're creating internal operating instructions, you can actually use iFixit as a wiki. If you're training folks or you have your senior tech, like, like with Ivan, so your senior tech is out, if he had documented how he does what he does, maybe it would have been easier for somebody other than you to fill in his shoes. <laughs> So we have found that even for businesses that just need to train, uh, train internal folks, you can actually use iFix as a public wiki, and then you get the benefit of everybody else in the world actually helping you maintain and improve your, your operating instructions. So I'll share a little bit of that. This is uh, the iFixit website. We started out with Apple products. We are completely comprehensive with service information for Apple products from 1998 onwards. Uh, so that the, the first computers that we did were the PowerBook G3s and the iBooks, but we're all the way up to these current things. And uh, you know, I always say we're completely comprehensive. We don't have an iPad Air service manual yet. <laughs> we're writing it right now. It'll be online in a week or two. <laughs> so every time they come out with new, new uh, devices, we have to write the manuals and get them online. But we're working on it. We are completely comprehensive with game consoles until Thursday. When, <laughs> when there's a new one, but we're we're gonna get it. We're gonna post a teardown of how to get inside uh, the PS4. Hopefully before it goes on the market here. Um, and then in terms of cell phones, I said there's over 5,000 cell phones out there. We have step-by-step -step repair guides for. It says there are three. I think we're over 400 cell phones now. So by model, we're less than 10% of the total phones out there. And I'll note we have specific instructions for every phone on how to take it apart because an HTC Evo Touch 4G is very different than some of the other HTC phones to, to work on. So the goal is step-by-step machine-specific instructions for every single device. Now, even though we're less than 10% of the total, we are uh, far greater than 10% in terms of market share. I mean, the, the iPhone has maybe 25% market share. The Samsung Galaxy S3 and 4 have another 25%. So you can, you can target specific machines and get a lot of it. So I would guess that we're probably cover about 60% of the cell phones out in the market, 60% of the phones you're going to run into. Uh, but clearly, 60% isn't anywhere near good enough. And we need to continue to work to make it better. By the way, we have a partnership with a number of uh, engineering universities. I think we have about 30 universities on board now, whereas part of the engineering cur curriculum, students write repair manuals. We have been trying to talk to the manufacturers to say, hey, share your service manuals with us. We'll make them available to the service community. I have gotten nothing but stonewalling from manufacturers on that. Uh, we've reached out to a number of them, and they have absolutely no interest. Apple is proactively fighting us. The rest of them are just sort of saying, no, we're not going to share them with you. So uh, we're having to go and create our own manuals. This is something over time, maybe enough of us band together, we can put pressure on the manufacturers. But in the meantime, we're just going to create our own manuals because it's legal, it works, it's been proven, and uh, it's, you know, we're getting r repair happening. In addition to the, the major things, I thought I'd share with you some of the kind of fun things we've got on iFixit. Uh, how many of you have seen the Will It Blend videos on YouTube where the guy blends the all right, yeah, so you know, he'll, he'll like blend a lawn rake or he'll blend an iPhone. Well, we got their blender and said, well, wouldn't that be fun to take it apart? So we did. It's actually really very well built. I highly recommend this blender. It's $300, which is 10 times at least what any other blender that you would buy would cost. It will last 10 times as long as any other blender that you would buy. The motor is, is seriously heavyweight. Um, this is one of my favorite teardowns that was contributed by a community member. This is, the, this is the very first product that was ever sold in the U.S. with the Sony logo on it. And you can't see it on the projector, uh, but this, this here is the Sony logo. And then inside it is super neat. 
this is like your old school. Like, that's a transistor and it's, you know, five millimeters tall. The m m coolest teardown we've ever done was this. This is Pleo. He's a robot dinosaur. He's about the size of a small cat. And we almost cried when we took him apart because he's absolutely adorable. He's got capacitive sensors on his skin. And as you pet him, he purrs. Oh. Step one, the first tool that you need to take apart Pleo is not a screwdriver. It was actually a scalpel. We had to cut the skin off him. And you brace yourself. This is the inside of Pleo. This is the most complex gizmo we have ever taken apart. Over 100 screws, nine microcontrollers, 12 motors. Very, very impressive piece of technology. Where did you find that? Where did we find Pleo? We got Pleo on the internet. There was a company named Ugobi that, that came out, and this was maybe five years ago. And they were, uh, they, they were designing this. And there was a lot of news. There was a lot of press around it at the time. And so we got it and took it apart. And, uh, they were selling this thing for $300, which seems like a lot for a toy, and it is, and it didn't sell that many, and then they went out of business. So that's a little sad. <laughs> Pleo met his demise. You can still buy them. The, the company that was making them for him continued to, to sell them, but there's, there's not ongoing research and development. We got all sorts of uh, product teardowns and gizmos on the site, lots of tablets, and I'm not going to go into all of them now. We'll, we will talk about how to repair different types of things. So this is a quadcopter. And this is actually a snap ring on the rotor on the quadcopter. And sometimes there's different techniques for working on different types of hardware than, than you deal with with, with electronics. Uh, this is a Microsoft Connect. It kind of looks like Johnny Five. No disassemble. So that's kind of iFixit. We are we're the world's R&D department. So I, I wanted to get in and talk a little bit about some of the techniques and tools that you need for working on small electronics. And this is um, increasingly hard to see. I'm going to see if I can adjust these down. So we developed the ProTech Toolkit. And I'll um, actually, Jeff, do you want to put one on every table so people can fiddle? Um, so this has all sorts of uh, little gizmos and the first thing you start needing is you're saying okay I'm used to working on PCs what do I need to work on mobile devices you need tweezers you need very precise tweezers you need a system for keeping track of uh, of parts as you go and so we developed a magnetic mat and there's other ways that you can do this but basically as you go keeping track of all the little bits and pieces is really critical and if you have a technician that wants to be able to work on three or four devices at once you need either a magnetic mat or some kind of sorting trays. Uh, you can use egg cartons. You can use plastic sorting trays. This is pretty nice because you can write on it with a dry erase marker and the parts stick to it. And actually, you can have a tech with four or five of these magnetic mats and stack jobs on top of it and then set them to the side. Uh, it's, it's a huge time sink if you leave and somebody jostles your workspace and you're, you're, you're looking around for little screws and brackets. So the, the rule number one of mobile device repair is you got to start thinking small. Everything, everything is, is, is very, very tiny. Um, and ESD is a bigger issue. So electrostatic discharge, you have to pay. The, as this stuff gets smaller, it gets more sensitive. So if you've got technicians, I suggest getting anti-static mats or some kind of anti-static work surface for them. And then have them in a, in a static-free environment. So this carpet is. You know, not great. This carpet isn't as bad. Shaggy carpet's a bad idea. You guys, what, like, what's your ESD setup? So uh, we actually, as with many things in our business, learned from experience. Um, brought a couple phones and a couple tablets, and then uh, kind of worked into this thing. But we uh, we put laminate floors on the bottom, and the laminate floors have a uh, electrostatic um, like padding under them. So by default, the store floor itself is electrostatic. Uh, on top of that, we have a uh, rubber mat that is also electrostatic and also helps the technician work uh, kind of like what they actually have at the uh, Genius Bar at the Apple Store. It's like a, like a fluffy surface, and it just makes standing on uh, on your feet easier. Uh, and then all the technicians wear bands that are electrostatic, and so we teach them techniques, you know, whether it's ground themselves before they work on a specific type of job. But and we, what we learn the hard way. But that's, yeah. yeah. Well, and you're not ever necessarily going to know. You're going to have a repair fail, and you're going to be scratching your head, and you'll say, why? And you won't know that it was static discharge that caused that problem. Instead, the, the static uh, issues will reveal themselves as statistics. So you'll look at it, and you'll say, OK, we have a 3% failure rate on repairs. Why? How do we increase the quality? 
and you roll out anti-static across everywhere and you might end up with a 2% failure rate. You're like, okay. I mean, that can be substantial in terms of your, your bottom line profit, but it's not something where you're, you're, you're moving around and you, you touch the board and you feel a zap, you know, oh, I just zapped the board. It's, it's much more subtle than that. This is, uh, include with the ProTech is a little anti-static thing. All you gotta do is just clip this to some kind of metal. Like if I have a metal desk, I'll try to just consciously touch the metal desk and then I'm good. But if you're working on it all day, you can use one of these and then it's just got a little clip that clips off. Okay, so to dismantle, this is an iPhone 5. The other tool that you need that you're not necessarily generally accustomed to is a suction cup. So we actually custom designed a suction cup for the ProTec toolkit, um, specifically for the iPhone 5 because it needed greater suction than we could get out of any existing uh, suction cup. So it used to be, when we first started with suction cups, we'd tell people like, you know, if you have a radar detector or, you know, uh, something in your, in your shower that sticks to the wall, just use one of those suction cups. And over time, you've actually needed, you need a pull tab on it or you got to get pliers on it and, and it use a fair amount of force to lift it up. Because on the iPhone 5, you, you stick the, um, the suction cup to the phone and you're, you're lifting it up and it takes quite a bit of force and there's tabs you have to, you have to undo and, once you've done it the first time, it, it, it makes sense and you sort of understand the amount of force that you have to apply. But the first time you take apart an iPhone 5, you really think you're going to break it with the amount of force that you're applying. And the, the 5S and the 5C are the same way. Uh, hang on, let me get you the, where's that mic at? No, I had a question that's related to this. My very first attempt at an iFixit job it was a few years ago on a PowerBook G4, the little thin aluminum case. Mm -hmm. And I thought your instructions online were wonderful until we got to the part about how do you get it back together? <laughs> you mentioned the little tabs. Yeah. Uh, that's when we really did need four hands. Uh -huh. My wife uh, helped me uh, yeah. get those in just the she right She supplied place. three hands and you had she the other supplied one. <laughs> Something like that. But anyway, I guess that's my point is that uh, if I had a criticism at all about some of the stuff that is online, and hey, I could have helped. <laughs> I could yeah. have put the uh, reassembly photographs sure. and instructions in there. Sure. But it's not a one person job, some of these jobs, I don't think. Yeah. Well, and that is a totally fair criticism. Uh, I fix it as kind of famous for at the end of all of our manuals, we'd have one sentence. Anybody know what that sentence is? Do it backwards. <laughs> so <laughs> we don't document the entire process both ways because it's kind of a waste of time. Like you can follow the instructions backwards. But there are points where you're like, oh, gee, I wish they would tell me. And so we do put reassembly notes uh, in the steps as you're going backwards. You pay attention to the reassembly notes. And the other thing is that the comments at the bottom of the page also tend to be, tend to be very instructive and very useful. Um, yeah, there's comments on a step level, so you can sort of see how other people have done it and what they've struggled with. But yeah, I mean, this is definitely a case. Over time, the manuals get dramatically better. Um, I, I absolutely agree with the comments portion. When we, especially when we repair a new device, just read all the comments if you could, or as many as you can. The first maybe 30, 40 comments. Yeah. So you'll see, uh, uh, I think the top is filtered by popularity. So you'll see like the comments that were most commented on or most replied to in the top, and you'll see things that are repetitive something like, you know, be careful with the tab, they might break when you put them back in, they're easy to pop out, but putting them back in might be more difficult. Yeah. Any other questions? So I am not going to like belabor the point and walk you through how to fix an iPhone 5. That's what the service manual online is for, but we do want to talk about some of the general trends and techniques that we're seeing. So once you get the case off, you know, we've got some EMI shields and things. Okay, the batteries in these things. This is a massive business opportunity for you. Every phone that's more than a year old needs a new battery. Um, the batteries last about 300 charges. Apple rates uh, the batteries on these at four, they, Apple claims at 400 charges you have 80% of the original battery left. That's not the case, it's less than that. How much less totally depends on the use case. Um, a phone can manifest, you know, it cannot be turning on. Uh, in this case, my, so this is an iPhone 4S, 11 months in, Battery had been getting worse and worse. At some point, it just stopped turning on. It got stuck in a, in a uh, boot up loop. It would get five seconds in, run out of juice, and shut off. Had to put a new battery in to continue the life. 
but it can be a huge value add. Let's say somebody brings in the phone to you and they're paying you for a screen repair. Say, hey, for another $30, you want me to throw a battery in? Just about all the time people will say yes. Uh, and, and the same thing with, you know, they come in, you're like, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm fixing the front screen for you. Would you like a nifty uh, rear panel like this? This is a uh, transparent rear panel. So you can upsell them on accessories and cases. And uh, just like you go into, um, you know, you, you go into Staples or Radio Shack, you're buying a cell phone. They actually make more money off the accessories than they do off the phone. Uh, you can do the same thing with repair services. Okay, little tiny screws. And this is just kind of a general, typical iFixit guide. I'll give you a bit of a feel for the sort of folks that are on iFixit. 91% of people told us that uh, iFixit had enabled them to do repairs they wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. So this was a survey we did last uh, January of about 13,000 community members. So this is showing that the information really is enabling technology and that you'll be able to hire technicians that don't necessarily have a tremendous amount of experience. So when we hire new technicians at iFixit, the first two weeks we set them down in front of computers. We tell them, here's the computer, here's the instructions, have fun. And we leave them alone. We come back two weeks later. And they've self-trained themselves using the instructions online. And then we go in and we start teaching them some of the more sophisticated troubleshooting and things that you really need a technician one-on-one -on -one to do training. But the initial rote learning how to disassemble this stuff, the instructions are plenty good. And people, most of the time, they're looking at the pictures and they're not even reading the text. 95% uh, told us that a successful repair makes them more likely to buy something from a manufacturer. I think that's really important for us when we're talking to manufacturers to try to encourage them to create repairable hardware because this is something that is a major, major problem for our industry, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. And then I was sort of shocked. The average number of things that pe people uh, said that they had repaired using iFixit was seven. So that's the average. There were some people that filled out the survey that said thousands, like I've fixed like 5,000 things using iFixit. So clearly that's probably somebody like you, <laughs> all of you, where you, know, you start a business, you're repairing things, you know, I fix five things a day, multiply it out by 10 years, and Okay, so you're all here saying I want to learn more about mobile device repair. Why do you all want to learn about mobile device repair? These are some very interesting stats. So on the left here, the dark uh, uh, line is PC sales over time. The sharply trending up line is iOS and Android added together. So we're, uh, and, and I think that's in the US, so that's over 200,000 iOS and Android devices sold every quarter. Apple just announced that they have sold, shipped 700 million iOS devices, uh, and you know you think about that, 700 million iOS devices, over time, every single one of those iOS devices that's more than a year old needs a new battery. A substantial portion of them could probably use a new screen. Many of them will have button issues, like on my phone, uh, this, is, this is causing me all sorts of fun. When I shake my phone, the volume down button activates. <laughs> And so it's constantly turning the volume down to zero. It's to the point where I, I basically just assume if somebody calls me, I'm not going to hear it. <laughs> and so I switch it over to vibrate. And so if it's not in my pocket, I don't get phone calls. I need to fix this. And it's, it's not that hard. It's actually, I think we sell the part for $20 or $25. It, it's not that expensive. It is kind of hard. It's, a, it's an hour or so process of completely dismantling the whole phone just to replace the little button and putting it back together. Uh, and, and this is, uh, you know, th there's an interesting opportunity for all of us in these devices being somewhat tricky to fix. Back in the day of the PowerBook, any of the, or these MacBooks, just about anything on here, like it, it, if a consumer had a broken screen on this laptop, I would say, absolutely, that's something you can replace yourself. Here's a new display assembly. Uh, you can install it in 20 or 30 minutes. It's not a big deal. Now, just something as simple as a, as a volume button, you're talking an hour of very intricate disassembly. It really helps to have some specialized tools like this to keep track of it. This is a business opportunity for all of you. Even though it's a little bit of a tricky repair, it's actually a barrier to consumers doing it themselves. Speaking of iPhones breaking, 26% break in the first two years. Uh, this is data that I got from Square Trade, which is an insurance company. So, Almost, pretty much 100% of iPhones that are actively used are going to need a new battery within, within two years. And then they're also going to need something else. Uh, most of them are dropped, but you've also got liquid damage. Liquid damage is a bit trickier to repair, and I'm not going to go into that now, but it's something that uh, uh, can be fixed to a certain degree. Do you, do you have? I, I have some questions. Sure. Could, you, you 
you mentioned square trade. Um, that was one of the things I did for first the Geek Squad or someone of that mm -hmm. nature. Uh, the Best Buy sells their warranty. Apple sells their mm -hmm. warranty. You go through square trade, and that warranty substantially less and substantially longer. Um, but once you do a repair like this, you void those warranties. Is my first question. The second question is <coughs> the magnetic map and magnetic tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because of <coughs> hard drive. Right. Well, if you, if you can find the hard drive in this, we can talk. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, magnets aren't a problem anymore. Yeah, correct. Yeah. We would be lost without magnetic tip screwdrivers. Yeah, you cannot, you could not do the repairs yeah, without a magnetic tip screwdriver. It's, you would be, you would claw your eyeballs out Most before you. parts being aluminum or stainless steel. Yeah. That magnetic map right. is kind of useless. Right, so that's the answer to your second question is, are magnets a problem? No, magnets aren't a problem anymore. All right, first question, what about warranties? Doesn't doing repairs void the warranties? Well, I mean, maybe. Um, let me, uh, okay. Uh, so doesn't, doesn't doing uh, re repairs void the warranties? If, the, if you, it needs a repair, it's probably out of warranty. So if you look at this and you say 76% of people drop their phone, well, when you dropped your phone, you voided the warranty. The warranty doesn't cover a cracked screen. So um, th that's, that's the answer on that. On the other side, actually, the consumer protection laws in the US don't allow manufacturers to void warranties when consumers perform repairs. So, uh, and this is esoteric in the law, but if you like, I've, I've, I'm probably one of the few people in the world that has actually read Apple's full warranty. And it very explicitly says that if you are doing a repair, the parts that you replace are not covered, and any parts that you damage during the repair are not covered, but it does not void the warranty of the device. That's, that's the leather of the law. Now, are you going to be able to get away with that argument at a local Apple store with somebody who doesn't have a law degree? Mm -hmm. But that's, that's what the law says. Well, we, yeah. find, we, we see a lot of people who bring uh, like an iPhone 4 or 4S that has a damaged screen, something like that. Or, sorry, at, at that time, an iPhone 4 or 4S. And uh, they would repair the device and then take it to the Apple store and get a warranty replacement. And we've never had an issue with that. We actually used to have people that come back and say, thank you so much. You got me a brand new phone for free. Uh, we also have seen a great opportunity with now 5Ss. So we um, I have a good relationship with the Apple stores in my, in my neighborhood. They know who I am. Um, and so I, I get some sort of information sometimes for them. So for example, recently we found out that iPhone 5S is, they're, they're replacing iPhone 5S screens for $275. Mm -hmm. And we were able to source the part for less and so we can do the repair for less. So we get all day long, um, well, not, not, not yet for 5S, but I, I predict in the next you know, three to six months it'll increase significantly, an increased amount of repair, repair requests for that device and we can offer it at a lower price. So, you know, like I said, once you crack a screen, you avoid your warranty. Yeah. So if they can come and get a screen swap and then even take it to the Apple store and get them to give me a warranty replacement, now they're back on their one-year warranty. I've made a few bucks on the repair, and it sort of makes sense for all parties. Okay, so I said the market is fragmented. This is just kind of a useful graph, uh, and we can share these slides so you can all reference this later, but this is uh, market share. So this is the cumulative number of these devices that have been sold over time. Um, and, and the thing that I would note, and by the way, this only goes back, so this is a year old, but you can see that the newer devices, the adoption curve on those is faster than some of the older devices were. So the, the rate that these mobile devices are penetrating uh, uh, the entire uh, marketplace is, is growing, which just means that the opportunity is growing for us. And then this is just quarterly uh, iPhone sales over the last few years, and then breaking that down and saying, okay, how many of these things are actually ready to repair so this is cumulative sold in the US, and then this is our estimate of the number that are repair ready. So massive, massive market opportunity. The other thing is, I wouldn't really worry about competition. Uh, there are so many of these devices out there broken. Uh, it's more about educating consumers, and the, I mean, a significant amount of the market opportunity is actually sitting in people's drawers. It's their backup phone that they have, or it's the phone that they broke and then went and got a new one and hung on to the old one. Uh, there, there's a, a lot of money sitting out there, uh, and that, I think that's that's attractive in the in the nonprofit realm. There's been a lot of nonprofits collecting phones and then sending them into folks like Recellular, sending them into you know uh, cell phones for soldiers and all of that. Well, if you can you know pick off 
some of those phones, do repairs yourselves and resell them yourselves, you can make a lot more money than just letting somebody else take the profit off of it. So th this is our estimate is that right now, like just busted phones sitting out there, that there's a $6 billion a year opportunity. Right now, the estimates are that the US cell phone repair market is about a billion dollar a year market. Uh, and in Bloomberg, uh, actually Business Week about a month ago, there was a story about a lot of these small repair shops that are starting up. Um, and this is just to reiterate, everything on iFixit is open source, so please do copy, steal, take whatever you want. Okay, um, the, as you're providing mobile device repair to customers, you, you kind of want to think a little bit about the customer experience. If you think about the way that Apple designs their products, they want you to have a completely cohesive experience from when you open the box all the way through. They want it to uh, be seamless. They want you to be happy with the process. You should be thinking about designing your store or, or whatever experience you have with your customers the same way. So if that's, I am going to banks and picking up hardware from them and, and you know, refurbishing it or just taking the hardware away from them, the more you can make that process streamlined and easy and happy for them, pleasant for them, the better. Uh, with, with cell phone repair, the number one thing is, okay, it's my phone, I need it. I don't just need it tomorrow, like I need it now. So all the time that you have my phone that it is not in my hand, it is not helping me. <laughs> so uh, cell phone repair while you wait has been, has been really important. The other part of this is, okay, what happens in the inevitable 1% of cases where you're working on somebody's device and you break it? It's gonna happen. Uh, everybody screws up. Maybe, I mean, sometimes there, it's not actually a screw up. It could be a connector on the board that was already brittle and it pops off. And it's not your fault, but you can't really put that on the customer because that's your business. So you really got to think through all the implications of customer support. But if you can do mobile device uh, repairs while people wait, it can be very compelling. Um, it's to the point now where some of these repairs are so easy that I have, I've been to some mobile repair shops where you, you take it in and, and he, he has your phone and he says, okay, it'll be ready in an hour. And, I, and it's like, well, there's no way that repair is going to take you an hour. That's like a three minute repair, but okay. He wants to charge me $50, so he's going to take it on the back and watch Scooby-Doo for 58 minutes, fix the phone <laughs> in two minutes, and then give it back to me. Uh, so you see some of these local uh, places using tricks like that. Um, and then I already mentioned that there's, there's a huge opportunity to upsell uh, around additional products and services. And you can do that with traditional PCs. I mean, you can install screen protectors for people. Uh, people are kind of paranoid about installing screen protectors themselves, and I don't think they generally do a good job. The first time you install a screen protector, uh, you're probably going to screw it up, but after that, you get better at it. So d doing screen protectors is a huge added value. And then I already mentioned batteries. Um, another way that you can... Uh, potentially get value is doing doing device trade-in and I won't go into this too much I think there's gonna be a bunch of folks at this conference that will buy uh, mobile devices off of you uh, there's a it's a huge growing market I mean folks like gazelle and recellular and and lots of these these folks are very happy to buy buy electronics off of you in quantity